I'm John Elvidge, Chair of the um, David Hume Institute, uh, and I'd like to begin by uh, thanking such an impressive number of you uh, for, uh, uh, for coming this evening on behalf of both the Institute and the Scottish uh, Fiscal uh, Commission. Uh, can I do the tedious thing first and ask everybody to make sure they've got their mobile phones uh, switched off? Uh, and then uh, I'll just give you uh, a brief outline of how we're structuring uh, uh, this evening. Uh, so um, we're, we're going to begin uh, with um, short uh, introductory uh, contributions uh, from, uh, from our three uh, contributors, and then we'll move into uh, a period of shared conversation uh, and then we will have the normal half an hour or so uh, for uh, questions uh, to widen the, uh, the discussion out. Uh, so uh, in, in sequence, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin with Robert Choate, uh, Chair of the Office for Budget Responsibility, who will talk to us about independent fiscal institutions uh, and the OBR's structure, functions and challenges. And then Dame Susan Rice, Chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, will address the Commission's origins and the unique aspects of the Scottish operating uh, context. And then uh, Alison Stafford, Director General, Scottish Exchequer in the Scottish Government, uh, will um, uh, join us to uh, provide some context for the, uh, for, uh, for the setting in which uh, these institutions uh, exist and operate. Uh, so, as I say, we'll 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 begin with um, we'll begin with Robert, who's been chair of uh, the OBR since 2010. Uh, he also chairs the OECD's network of parliamentary budget offices and independent fiscal institutions, as well as the external advisory group of the Irish Parliamentary Budget Office. Uh, Robert's previously served as director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, a senior advisor at the IMF, uh, economics editor of the Financial Times, and as a writer at the Independent and Independent on Sunday. He's chair of the Royal Statistical Society's advisory group on public data literacy and governor of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. He's also a member of the Finance Committee of the University of Cambridge and the Advisory Committee of the ESRC Centre for Macroeconomics. Please join me in welcoming Robert. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, John, for that introduction and a reminder I have too many committees. So I must start uh, shedding some of them. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, wonderful to see uh, so many of you here with a keen interest in the role of independent uh, fiscal institutions. It certainly warms our hearts, I think, to, uh, to see that interest. Um, what I'm going to do is to, is to basically set a little bit of background about these sorts of institutions uh, as a breed, um, a little bit of history, a little bit of international context, and then say something more specific about the role of the OBR, and then come on to the way in which we interact with uh, the Fiscal Commission and our particular uh, role uh, in Scotland. So to kick off with, um, if you think about uh, the, these sorts of institutions, independent fiscal institutions, the crucial thing is that they are at once independent and yet official as well, which is as you can see, you only have to set that out to see there's an, a sort of, you know, an inevitable potential tension there. But the idea is, is to combine that independence with uh, an official status. And these bodies uh, are generally uh, designed to provide independent, uh, uh, non-partisan, politically untainted uh, analysis of countries, public finances, and the impact that particular policy decisions have on them. There are now, I think, about 40 countries around the world that have uh, institutions of this sort. 
Uh, some of them are decades old, one of the earliest and best established uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the Central Planning Bureau. They don't call it uh, that anymore, they just use the uh, initials, doesn't sound uh, terribly uh, modern. Uh, you have then other famous large examples like the Congressional Budget Office uh, created in the United States uh, in the 1970s. There have then subsequently been two uh, waves of these institutions being uh, created uh, in more recent years. Firstly, in the wake uh, of the financial crisis, uh, and then more recently as now a requirement in effect of countries that are uh, members of the euro, that they should have uh, these sorts of institutions looking at their uh, public finances. They differ quite a lot from country to country in the role that they've been given and the structure that they have and precisely how they're situated as institutions. And that's because in different countries, the disease they are designed to cure is perceived in different ways and they have different systems of government uh, to uh, fit into. So some are standalone bodies, some are linked relatively closely to the executive uh, part of government, some are linked to uh, parliaments, uh, to central banks, to audit institutions. So there's a considerable degree of, of variety. Uh, and a growing number, not an enormous number yet, have institutions of this sort at different levels of government, particularly, obviously, federal uh, nations, some uh, states of the United States, and Australia, provinces uh, of Canada, etc., as well as the, uh, the arrangements uh, here. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, we have a, a network in which we all uh, get together and uh, cry into each other's beer, uh, organized by the OECD. We're meeting in Portugal in a few weeks' time, so we should be crying into our port as distinct to uh, into our beer. Um, but uh, that use, there is a useful international community here, particularly for younger and newer institutions that are being created, uh, a, set, a shared set of what would good practices and responsibilities uh, would be. So why might you create institutions of this sort? The analytical reason essentially is that is the assumption that left to their own devices, uh, democratic governments rely too much on government borrowing, uh, especially oddly in good times when the economy and the public finances appear to be performing well. There's either a, a cynical or a benign tendency to uh, assume that the good times will go on forever and that they're quite possibly a result of the policies that you've implemented. And having an independent institution with a slightly more cynical slash realistic eye uh, can be no bad uh, thing. Uh, that degree of excess of, uh, of borrowing, there are, you know, the political science literature has different, different explanations for why that might be short-sightedness, electoral competition, the particular challenges of countries where you have multiple parties in, in coalitions reaching agreements on taxation and spending policy uh, together. One key distinction between these sorts of institutions and uh, other independent economic institutions, uh, specifically central banks who set interest rates, decide monetary policy, is that we are not policy-making bodies. We don't have any lever to pull. We don't have any decision that we can enforce. All of these institutions are essentially providing either analysis or analysis plus advice and the aim really is to increase the political and reputational cost of making unsustainable decisions, as distinct from saying that these institutions should be able to trump the democratic right of politicians to decide for themselves. So you're putting that information, that analysis out there, but at the end of the day, uh, it's for elected politicians to uh, make their decisions. And I think that the biggest contribution that IFIs can make I'd love to say we're going to deliver you a perfect forecast for the economy and the public finances every time we do it. You'd be mad to claim that. But what we can do, I think, relative to uh, political bodies that do this is to promise greater transparency, greater information about what's going on in the public finances. And I think it's also easier for technocratic institutions to be candid about the uncertainties that lie around all assessments of what's going on in the public finances than for politicians for whom there's you know, a political cost to admitting that you might not have been right the last time you were uh, making a comment of that sort. So for the OBR, uh, our role and structure uh, reflects, you know, a history before we were created of people being concerned that the government, the Treasury specifically, would uh, produce systematically over-optimistic assessments of the public finances and the danger of them moving the goalposts of fiscal targets when governments set objectives for how much they'll borrow, how much debt they will 
have. So we're more designed as one of those institutions than as an institution to help parliaments consider different options as, say, the CBO would be in the United States. So to that aim, we have a variety of activities. We produce twice a year, five-year-ahead forecasts for the economy and the public finances. We assess progress against the fiscal targets. We look at the public sector balance sheet. We look at the long-term outlook for the public finances. We comment on the uh, data about the public finances as it evolves through the year, uh, etc. What we don't do, uh, and some other fiscal institutions do, is to give policy advice or policy recommendations. So we will say, this is what we think this particular tax or spending policy will cost. We don't say we think that this particular tax or spending policy is mad, unfair, insane, uh, or that. You can occasionally see arching of an eyebrow, which might lead you to draw conclusions, but that would be an entirely false thing uh, to do. Um, in terms of our structure and the way that that feeds into our necessary uh, independence, we are a quango. We are a you know, public sector body. Uh, formally speaking, we come under the, the budget of the, of the Treasury Group uh, in London. Uh, we are uh, a body with a committee of three people who actually make the decisions and have to uh, uh, stand behind the judgments that the institutions make, and we're supported, and most of the, uh, the work is done, uh, by 30 civil servant staff uh, or thereabout, which puts us roughly in the middle of these institutions in terms of, of size, etc. Our rights and responsibilities are set out in primary and secondary legislation, we try to set out rules of the game, memoranda of understanding with the uh, bodies, the arms of government with which we deal and also with other institutions with which we uh, cooperate and work, including the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So we have, uh, you know, we set out the way in which we, we uh, uh, act with each other. We work with each other to our respective objectives. We have guaranteed access to the information that we require uh, in legislation and we have a published budget. If you look at these sort of institutions in other countries, the most frequent complaints they get, or they have, are that they don't get the information that they need to do their job, and that they're not given the money adequate to the task. So those two things are uh, very important. But ultimately, our independence is established and maintained not by legislation, by memoranda, by rules. It's about the way in which you do your job day in, day out, trying to do it as transparently as you can, looking self-critically at your own performance and highlighting uh, the uncertainty around almost all the judgments that you end up making. Finally, if I turn to our role specifically in the uh, Scottish context, uh, the Scotland Act back in 2012, which began the process of uh, taxation and spending uh, devolution uh, required us or asked us to produce forecasts for the devolved taxes, income tax, uh, land and building transactions tax, etc. Uh, and that has been extended with the Scotland Act 2016 to air passenger duty, devolved social security, uh, that growing over time. Now, in fact, of course, because the OBR has to produce forecasts for the whole UK public finances, we already had to, we would have to produce those forecasts uh, anyway, as we do for local government, different layers of government as well. So in practice, that requirement has meant a greater degree of focus on those sorts of areas for us relative to the size of the sums and money involved, a dedicated publication uh, on our devolved tax and spending forecasts and regular hearings before the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament, which we will both be doing uh, tomorrow morning. We have no direct role, so please don't send any complaints to me on the operation of the block grant uh, mechanism. Uh, we provide the numbers. It is for others to decide uh, what they do with them. Uh, but the, uh, the robustness, hopefully, of that analysis is uh, valuable uh, in itself. In terms of our relationship with the Commission, uh, well, uh, Susan will obviously say, tell you more about what the Commission is doing, but we've had a very close working relationship throughout, based, I think, on a shared commitment to transparency and the need for robust uh, analysis. Uh, we're very keen because we're looking at many of the same challenges and trying to work out the same puzzles on what's going on in the data, what's the outlook, etc., to exchange information. And obviously, the Fiscal Commission is much closer to the ground on that specific to the, uh, to the receipts uh, here. So uh, we uh, value that enormously, and we've also had very good working relations with uh, Scottish government officials. I think it's fair to say that we are both 
independent institutions, and we have absolutely no anxiety about coming up with different answers to the same question. And in a way, it's inevitable. People will you know, come to different views on these things, and of course, we're making those judgments at different times on different sets of information and on different states of play as regards policy is concerned. But I think we have a shared determination hopefully to explain to you as best we can why the numbers we come up with may be different when they are. And I think there is also a value in having uh, two forecasters acting as a cross-check. It makes both of our forecasts better than if either one of us was doing it on our own. I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dame Susan Rice, who's been chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission since 2014. Uh, uh, like Robert, she has a perplexing variety of other roles, uh, which include the, uh, the chairman of Scottish Water, president of the Scottish Council uh, for Development and Industry, uh, a non-executive director of Jay Sainsbury and the Banking Standards Board, and a lay member of the Court of Edinburgh University. Uh, previously, uh, Susan has served as Senior Vice President at Nat NatWest Bancor in New York, Dean at Yale and Colgate Universities, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive of Lloyd's Scotland, and Managing Director of Lloyd's Banking Group. Susan. Thank you. John, thank you very much, and um, thank you. Robert, I thought that was a really clear, lucid introduction, not just to the OBR, but to the world of independent fiscal institutions, IFIs, um, as they're known to those of us <laughs> immersed in this world, and sometimes it feels a bit iffy uh, as one goes along. Um, but immersed, I've been for the last several years, not as long as Robert, even though I came into it with barely a toe in the water. Um, if you think back to the spring of 2014, 2014, it was a time of great debate in Scotland about a possible referendum but it was also a time when some tax changes were afoot. John Swinney, who was then the finance minister, phoned me one evening and he said, Susan, you'll likely be aware that a couple of taxes are about to be devolved to Scotland. I'm minded to set up a small commission operating independently, boy was that word important to hear, um, to scrutinize the Scottish government's forecasts of receipts for these new taxes and assess whether they're reasonable. I've got two top-notch academic economists willing to come on board, and I'd like to put your name forward to chair the commission. So I was polite enough, after I kind of caught my breath, um, to thank him for the compliment, but said that while I pay my taxes, because life's too short to do otherwise, um, I was hardly a tax expert, nor was I an academic, nor was I an economist, and I had no free time, which he kind of knew. Why me, I asked, um, and he said uh, in response that he wanted someone to chair this body who could actually set it up, who had some experience kind of creating the, the elements of, of, an, of an organization, and who dealt directly with people and businesses, and I did that through my business, uh, you know, the role I had in business. He and I were both in a car at the time, heading to different destinations, as chance would have it. I got to mine first, um, somewhat courteous. I'd run out of protests and excuses, so I agreed. To what? I have had no idea at the time. I said, all right, we'll do this. Um, fast forward several months, just post a parliamentary debate here to approve our appointments, and someone called Robert Choate got in touch. I didn't know him either at the time, but he appeared in my office one day. Actually, I did. I think I invited you. I said you could come. <laughs> and um, spent several hours sharing a huge amount from his experience at the OBR, just as he's given you a perspective this evening. As Robert's already highlighted, an IFI's role and functions depend greatly on the context in which it operates. For the most part, IFI's analyze public finances at a high level. They don't forecast the individual lines um, for spending and for tax in a budget. However, both the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR produce the forecasts which are used in our respective government's budgets, something that's almost unique in countries around the world that have these organizations. We also share, and I think you heard this from Robert, a driving ambition to produce independent, transparent, and high-quality forecasts and publications to communicate what we're doing, not simply do the work. 
In these ways, the OBR and the Commission share similar characteristics. However, there are a number of differences between the two of us, which, as you'd expect, relate to the distinctive fiscal devolution settlements under which we operate. So I'll pick up the thread now of what all this means here in Scotland, covering the context for setting up the Scottish Fiscal Commission as well as how and why our remit does differ from the OBRs. Go back again to 2014, the Scotland Act 2012 had devolved two taxes to the Scottish Parliament, stamp duty, land tax, that sounds really old fashioned from the past now, um, and landfill tax. The new Scottish Fiscal Commission, a non-statutory body was duly set up it comprised three of us, unpaid, and the promise of not very much work. I was absolutely promised six days in the year, and that was it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> some people know that that's something to laugh at. Um, following the referendum that autumn, the Smith Commission got together, and they recommended devolution of further tax powers and some Social Security benefits. Discussions then began between the UK and Scottish governments about how to devolve these new powers and what role the Scottish Fiscal Commission could and should play. At the same time, the Parliament here was debating the Scottish Fiscal Commission bill. I knew nothing about legislation before this and had to be given a kind of um, uh, teaching on what happened when a bill went to Parliament. Um, but that bill was to put us on a statutory basis. As the negotiations between the two governments progressed, it became more and more clear that our role would indeed change substantially. And all this came to pass in April 2017, when we became a statutory body responsible for producing independent fiscal forecasts, assessing the government's borrowing projections, and producing Scottish economic forecasts, which are important as they feed into our fiscal work, especially on income tax and VAT, as well as to the context for a Scotland-specific economic shock. All of this, we like to think, adds transparency to the Scottish budget. I'd note another conversation I had with Robert at that time in quite a modest bistro in Paris the evening before an OECD IFI conference. It was then that we began to map out how our two organizations might work together in a formal way once we were statutory. Though I have to say what was most memorable about that conversation was the little mouse who scurried under nearby tables gathering crumbs. I'd known that French restaurants welcomed dogs. I didn't know about other animals. Do you remember that, Robert? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's now 2019, and the commission has come a long way since our early days. We comprise four commissioners, and my three colleagues are here, um, scattered somewhere, and I see one, two. Anyway, um, I hope you get to meet, uh, to meet them. Um, so four uh, commissioners, and um, I think that together we offer a breadth of expertise. We also employ more than 20 staff. As with the OBR's Budget Responsibility Committee, we, the commissioners, are personally accountable for the output of the commission. The staff of the commission, our staff, directly produce the forecasts on our behalf. And this differs from the OBR approach where they mainly use teams in HMRC, DWP, big government agencies and other departments to produce their fiscal forecasts under the guidance <coughs> of the OBR uh, members. But this difference relates to the context, again, of devolution. When the OBR was established, there obviously was a long history of fiscal forecasting in those departments, while in Scotland this was just so much newer. So these were big changes for us in the Commission, and they correspond to even bigger changes in the Scottish Government's funding arrangements and budget process. Back in 2014, when we were first established, the Scottish Government's tax power, singular, was non-domestic rates, which accounted for about 6% of the Government's budget here. Next year, with income tax as well as land and buildings transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax, devolved tax revenues will account for 36% of the Scottish government's total budget. And of course, the journey doesn't stop there. Although devolution of air passenger duty has been delayed, that assignment is due to begin in 2020. Once those two are added in, the proportion of the budget will increase to just over 50%, just over half, coming from devolved taxes. And there's another aspect of our work which is growing quickly, Social Security. We've seen the new Social Security Agency in Scotland begin to make the first payments for two new benefits, the Carers Allowance Supplement and the Best Start Grant. This is the starting point for what will become the devolution of over £3 billion of Social Security spending here in Scotland. <laughs> 
By now, you may well be wondering, what about fiscal sustainability and the government's fiscal targets, matters we regularly hear discussed by the OBR, by Robert. Um, again, back to the context of fiscal devolution. We have a role assessing the Scottish government's borrowing projections. However, as their borrowing powers are constrained by law and also because they must have a balanced budget each year, there isn't the same need here as at the UK level to provide regular assessments of fiscal targets. Likewise, we don't forecast all public spending, only Social Security is defined by our legislation, and that's because it's this area where eligibility-driven spending suggests that independent forecasts are likely to be helpful in setting the Scottish budget. As our work broadens, our forecasts are an increasingly important component of the Scottish budget. Both our tax and social security forecasts uh, must be used by the finance secretary in the budget. That's partly why we draw on Scotland-specific data to the extent possible and keep pushing for more. The OBR's forecasts of UK government tax revenues and social security spending are then used to calculate the block grant adjustments applied to the Scottish budget. When you add in the third element, the block grant, you put it all together, Scotland keeps running. But of course, the commission is one element in the new fiscal landscape here, which has been quite a feat to create, as we'll hear in a minute from Alison Stafford, Director General, Scottish Exchequer. Although we never had a mouse crossing our path, um, my conversations with Alison along the way have been absolutely invaluable. So let me close with the reminder, as Robert said, forecasts are pretty much always wrong. We don't claim to have them error free. But, and I'm sure Robert would agree with this, by setting out to be as transparent as possible about how our respective forecasts are derived and by operating as independent organizations, politically, intellectually independent, we believe we go a long way to reducing the risk of bias in our respective forecasts and we believe that that serves our country's needs. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and so our, uh, our final speaker is, um, uh, is Alison Stafford, who, uh, Director General of Scottish Exchequer, uh, with responsibility for the overall Scottish budget, including tax, spending and measuring performance, and for advice, support and systems on finance and procurement. Alison joined the Scottish Government in 2005, previously serving as Director General of Finance and Director of Finance. Um, before that, uh, Alison's background uh, is in the NHS, uh, leading strategic operational and corporate services in England and Scotland as both a Chief Executive and a Director of Finance. Alison. So, good evening everyone. Um, so the focus this evening obviously is to hear about the independent fiscal work of the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Uh, but I'm here just to provide just a few words of context of that journey. And as Sir John has said, I started in the Scottish Government in 2005 and actually have had the privilege of working with Scottish ministers over that period of time in actually shaping the, the policy context and creating the fiscal institutional landscape that we see in Scotland today, and we've not finished yet. Um, the other thing I would say is that actually Sir John was part of that instrumental change. He was one of the people that said, actually, a budget of that stage, which was in the mid 20 billion pounds a year in Scotland, actually should be led by someone professionally qualified. So I'm a professionally qualified chartered accountant with private sector experience and public exper sector experience as SIPFA qualified as well. And actually it's been really interesting to see how those skills have come together with the journey that we've been on. One of the first things obviously was responding to the financial crash in 2008-9 and that actually started to put a different flavour about the sort of relationship that government had um, with the sort of wider economic landscape here in Scotland. But let's, let's get to the sort of very specific things. I say that the budget we had in 2005 was in the mid 20 billion. Just to give you a sense of how that's now changed, the budget that's been laid out as a draft budget to Parliament for next year, 2019-20, is 42 and a half billion pounds for Scotland. That's quite a material change. And a lot of that obviously is reflecting a different settlement of devolution of services that are actually provided here in Scotland. 
But the other big thing has, that has changed is this evolution in our fiscal landscape and our fiscal fortunes. So the Cowman Commission led to the Scotland Act 2012, some relatively small changes there, but still important in terms of that tax landscape. And as Susan has already said, that brought the introduction of the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and the Scottish Landfill Tax as well. And um, signalled then some of that first start of change in our fiscal institutional landscape. So we're focusing on the Scottish Fiscal Commission tonight, but also in January 2015, Revenue Scotland was established. And that was the organisation to administer those locally devolved taxes here in Scotland. So those two that I've just mentioned. And those, those taxes went live in 2015, April 2015. And just to point out, you know, those, the legislation that was put in place for those taxes and for establishing the Revenue Scotland organisation was the first tax legislation we'd seen in Scotland here for 300 years. So that, that was quite a material change. Scotland Act 2016 then has brought these other really material changes in terms of proportions and the income tax figures now that are a part of our budget for next year estimated at £11.7 billion. Pounds. So you're starting to see there's a very different relationship that's now happening between the citizen and the Scottish government about that mix between tax and spend and also the rhythm of business that takes place in the parliament. We've changed slightly the, 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 the normal sort of timetabling of budget considerations. There's still the time for thorough scrutiny but also with the bringing in of the national performance framework, that emphasis on outcomes is part of that journey as well and has been for over 10 years now, but has been refreshed in this last year. The other key thing to say is that with all of these changes from having largely a spend profile in Scotland, a budget that was really focusing on spend, that was largely funded with exception of non-domestic rates from a block grant from Westminster to one now where we have this dynamic still between a block grant, but that is adjusted each year. It's reduced to account for the fact that there are now taxes raised locally here in Scotland. And it's those dynamics that actually then generated the thinking and the recognition and the importance of actually having independent fiscal forecasting and input into those, those numerical calculations that are done for the budget each year. And therefore, the Scottish Government actually has worked both with the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission over that time to make sure that those, those, the way that that is done and actually how that then is recognised by the Parliament, the appropriate scrutiny of that by the, by the bodies concerned, actually sort of takes place. And, um, and I think it's really important as well that you'll have noticed my name title has changed over that time. I was Director of Finance, DG Finance, now it's Scottish Exchequer. And I think this is actually pointing us to the fact that there's a much more complex landscape and there's much more of a need for us to be um, using these forecasts and also thinking about this over a longer term period. Uh, we have annual budgets, but actually for the first time last year, the Scottish Government published the medium term financial strategy. So these things are all vital. There is a fiscal framework, a formal document that's agreed between the Scottish Government and the Treasury in Westminster as to how all of these various elements actually sit together. Um, for those of you who may be in financial services in the room and in banking institutions, I would suggest that the Scottish Government probably now operates in one of the most highly regulated spaces that it ever has been. This fiscal framework, the conditions and rules around that, the conditions around borrowing, because we don't have full flexibility to borrow. It's really important those are constrained. Um, these are the various elements that actually mean all the, these changes that have taken place in our fiscal institutional landscape are vital parts of actually making sure that we have something that is coherent in terms of the budget position, that there is the important transparency around our income and those verifications that take place with the general public and also for the scrutiny that now happens within Parliament as well. So um, as far as this fiscal institutional landscape is concerned, it's not stopping there. I would just mention one other thing that is in development, which is the Scottish National Investment Bank. 
Um, but that's just to say that this is a continuing evolution. Tonight is to focus on the Fiscal Commission and the work of the OBR. And I just want to sort of put on record my, my thanks to both, both colleagues that are from those organisations, both for the support that they've provided in terms when we were thinking some of these things through, but actually now in the implementation of it and how we um, have robust but appropriate type of um, professional conversations to enable the independent work to take place and for the government and the parliament to be able to place reliance on that in the way that our budgets are now shaped going forward. So just a very brief summary of some of those changes. Thank you. Okay, as I said, we'll now, we'll now move into a, uh, a period of shared discussion. Uh, Alison, Alison, you mentioned that income tax is forecast to account for 11.7 billion of uh, uh, the Scottish government's revenues next year, and I wondered if we might, uh, if, if if we might use income tax as a framework for understanding uh, some of the uh, some of the specific issues and uh, and uh, relationships. And I wondered whether Susan or Robert might want to say something about the challenges of forecasting uh, uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish income tax and, and uh, if relevant, the differences between the approaches in the two organisations. Maybe, why don't I start just by explaining, <coughs> excuse me, the basic elements of our, our income tax, forgive me, <coughs> and, um, and then we can maybe between us talk about uh, what's different. So when we talk about Scottish income tax, we're talking about non-savings, non-dividend income tax, first of all, so it's not everything, um, but pensions, uh, income, salary income, and other forms of income. Um, the Scottish government has the right in legislation to vary um, what it charges at the different bands, the different rates, by 10p up or down. Um, and it also, more recently, was given the ability to change the level or the threshold at which those rates uh, kick in and indeed to add um, additional bands uh, if it wants to. So it has quite a few powers, um, but it is not all of income tax, if you see what I mean. Um, and, uh, and it has actually exercised some of those powers. So a couple of years ago, two, well, two years ago, um, it decided to add an extra um, highest rate. That's not the name of it, but it was a high rate, and now we have a, a higher rate of, uh, of income tax, and it set a level, it then froze it, and then this year when the UK government raised its threshold for its high rate, the Scottish government kept its threshold where it was. And so all of these changes, it, it sounds a little bit like on the edges, but actually it makes a difference to the, to the environment. Um, in terms of forecasting income tax, uh, we feed certain um, key factors in which come out of our economy forecast, which I mentioned before. Uh, we look at productivity, we look at uh, earnings growth, we look at a, a number of elements, but why don't I pause there, because I could go on forever and I don't want to do that. Robert, you talk about uh, what you see is different and the same. Uh, well, I think one of, I mean, one of the common features for both, both arrangements is that you, we, we start with an economic forecast and then you move to a forecast from uh, receipts. And there's no reason in terms of the economy, we have no privileged access to information about what is going on in the UK economy that is not available to, to everybody else. We have to produce an economic forecast ourselves because we need to focus on particular elements of it that are particularly relevant to helping us to understand what's going on in tax revenues and in, uh, in spending, whereas if you were doing this in a bank or in an academic institution, you'd be an interest, diff, interested in different aspects of how uh, the economy behaves. One key difference between the two of us is that we are, we are starting from the perspective of producing a forecast for the whole of the UK, uh, and then in that sense, thinking about uh, how we approach the task of producing uh, a Scottish forecast simultaneously with producing our forecast for the whole UK under very tight uh, 
time pressures in the days, weeks running up to a budget at a time when the UK government may be deciding on policy changes, not just ones, relatively simple ones like you know, moving uh, rates and thresholds, but much more complicated ones like the treatment of IR35, personal, you know, et cetera. You, uh, it, it's quite a task. So necessarily we approach this in a more top-down way of thinking about what the total amount of non-saving, non-dividend-based income tax would come in for the UK, and then think about what information we have about what's, what share of that would apply to Scotland or would come from Scotland, and whether there are particular reasons to believe that that share might be higher or lower than it was last year because maybe of policy changes in Scotland, in, uh, in Westminster, uh, or for other changes as well. Now, Susan's mentioned, obviously, that you've got a situation in which both you know, the UK government and the Scottish government are affecting the shape of their income tax systems in each, in each country or basket of countries. Clearly, one of the challenges for forecasting is that the more that those systems differ from one place to another, the more you need to concern yourself with how that might affect people's behavior. And obviously, you know, there's been lots of debate here about how the, the, the differences that are opening up between the Scottish and the uh, English, uh, for shorthand purposes, uh, income tax uh, systems might be affecting uh, behavior. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that, that interest can quite outweigh exactly the amounts of money that are involved here. But it is a real challenge of knowing how this is likely to affect people's location decisions particular challenge of those people who have residences in both Scotland and in England, how the, the choices they make there. Um, we've started off uh, in terms of thinking about the, the share of, of income tax that sums from Scotland on relying on, a, on a, something called the Survey of Personal Incomes, which is a, you know, a, a limited a survey of a limited, relatively large, but a group of people. We're now moving to a situation where you can draw on information that the, the, the tax authorities ask people to flag whether you are a Scottish or a non-Scottish taxpayer. Now that system is having to bed itself in. We're getting that information. We were surprised uh, that you know the uh, the first set of outturn data based on whether people tick the box and say that they're Scottish taxpayers suggested that the share of Scottish income tax was rather smaller than the surveys had, but we don't net know you know we'll never know which of those was entirely right, and we'll need to see how that evolves over time. So it does create an additional uh, challenge here beyond what either one of us would face if we were just doing it for one country. And just one other final point, and that is that uh, the OBR you know, comes out with something from the Scottish income tax forecasts. We do as well. They will never match, uh, ever, uh, not least because the timing is different, because yours might be typically five, six, eight weeks at, you know, ahead of ours, because it follows the timing of the UK budget, um, and, and we follow the Scottish uh, uh, budget uh, timetables. So uh, we'll always have different numbers here as well. Uh, makes life interesting. Just to add, obviously, when you're sitting in the Scottish government, then the block grant that comes from Westminster is adjusted according to the forecast figures that are calculated by the OBR. And the tax revenues then that are replacing that and adding to it are calculated by forecasts generated by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So, um, and that's just because of different reliances that are placed by Treasury on particular elements and, and actually having something that is uh, using data that's more granular and more attuned to the Scottish picture from the point of view of the Scottish income tax forecasts. But you can see then that it's, it's quite interesting both in explaining that to the general public and to Parliament as well, but equally when those forecasts then change because there are reconciliations that happen at particular points in time. If those two forecasts ultimately then change in the same direction, then that's fine. When we get a time when they change in different directions, that's when life gets more interesting and, um, and there are particular reconciliations then that have to be made because as both, um, both contributions have already pointed out, each year Scotland has to balance its budget. Mm -hmm. It cannot rely on borrowing to close that gap. Um, so there will be reconciliations and there will be correcting figures that will be taken into account in future years' budgets that we will then have to plan for. But that's where this, as I say, becomes quite a, 
quite a complex and interesting landscape that we all work within. And given the point that Alison's just made about uh, the need to balance the budget and the absence of uh, mechanisms for dealing with errors, I, from a layperson's point of view, the very short track record we have uh, of data to assist forecasting might be expected to magnify forecasting errors. Is that a problem? You're looking at me, right? <laughs> um, so, to some extent, yes. I mean, it, it, it means there may be volatility, but for the different taxes as well, we get our so-called outturn data on different timetables. So for the fully devolved taxes, um, Revenue Scotland are collecting the taxes and they can prepare reports and, and, and give us information fairly quickly, relatively speaking. Uh, for income tax, 16 months after the end of a fiscal year is when we get the outturn data for that fiscal year. So it takes quite a long time in, in actual time terms to work out what the error was and then to begin to assess why that error existed. Um, this whole situation is forming, and I think you, you get that picture from what we're all saying, and it will evolve over time, and it will all get better over time because we'll build that track record. But right now, every year, we're bringing new, new elements into it. And yeah, I think the answer is that we'll um, certainly put a spotlight on differences in errors. I think one, one point that I think both of us regard as important is, is reminding people every time we do a forecast that no sane person bets the farm on any particular macroeconomic or revenue and spending forecast turning out to be correct in every respect. We spend a lot of time in the, in the analysis that we do explaining, you know, given this forecast, how confident you should you be that the answer will actually be the one that the central expectation that you've put out. So you can look back, which is easier for us because we can draw on a longer period of our own forecasts and also the forecasts that the Treasury did before we took them over. So you can say, look, if you knew nothing other than you've landed from Mars, you know what our latest forecast is and how good past ones were, how confident you would be. We can also point out, you know, those judgments that we've had to make that we could get them really quite wrong and it doesn't make that much difference to the, to the numbers on the ones that, to which it's really very sensitive. But you know, if you look at our, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, forecast uh, errors, the differences from outturn, you know, it's 1%, it's 4% it's plus at a two-year time horizon. And that's partly because, you know, there will be policy changes in that period. It's partly because the economy will behave differently. It's partly because the amount of money you get out of every pound of spending or income that there is in the economy will be different. And, you know, we constantly point out that, you know, in the Westminster context, the government has to take policy decisions in full knowledge of the fact that they have to be robust to a variety of outcomes and not just on the expectation that a particular answer will come out. And yet, in decisions, look at the last budget, the government you know, you know, went to great efforts to ensure that a particular measure of the budget deficit in two years' time would be the same as they predicted in the previous fiscal event to the nearest 0.1 billion pounds, which is fiscally and statistically completely insignificant. Uh, but they felt that that was an important thing to do. And that, that means that you end up with a greater degree of policy being fine-tuned as forecasts move around than perhaps you know, some people might think was, uh, was sensible. There are also, because of the reconciliation process, there's a more, there's a more strict, you know, nobody loses out in the end, but the end includes a period of, uh, of, as you say, an adjustment which is challenging to explain and awkward to plan for. And, I mean, I think we can all understand the, the points about the inherent difficulties of forecasting, and we can all empathise with your no sane person would assume that you're going to uh, hit it bang on the nail, Robert. But Alison was explaining that these forecasts are used in a relatively mechanistic way to, uh, to determine the aggregate of the budget. Alison, how does, you know, how does reconciling the inherent uncertainty of forecasts with the, with the, with the, uh, with the system uh, affect the, the task? Um, well, it certainly makes life interesting. And, um, and as Susan has already pointed out, the legislation actually requires Scottish ministers to use the forecasts 
I mean, there is, there is an element that says that if, you, if a minister chose not to, then they would have to explain why not. Uh, but certainly the custom and practice, short as it may be, has been to actually use those forecasts. And it's, and it's also part of just, again, that rigor of that those, those key elements, if you think about it, any one of us are most at risk if we try and overestimate how much money we think we've got to spend in any one month, year, um, period of time. So it's, it's putting that sort of discipline, even though we don't have the means to borrow to balance it off. Um, but I think for us, it will be when these correcting elements come in that will be the most challenging. So the very first year, when um, these taxes and the forecasts were being used, then that was accepted between Treasury and ourselves in the fiscal framework, that there would be no corrections for that. But actually, the tax um, year of 2017-18 um, will actually be the first year when there will be actual requirements for reconciliations, and if there is a, a plus or a minus associated with that, the budget that we will have to take that into account is 2020-21. Um, and I think that's, that's the key thing. There will always now be, after this budget that's drafted and with Parliament to consider now, there will always be an adjustment of some kind. And actually helping people plan for that. Um, and the fact that that will change, no doubt, year on year. It won't necessarily be the same sort of number each time. Is just adding to that, that whole point. And I think that's where then the government... Um, embracing and actually publishing something that says about what the medium-term picture looks like has been another sort of major step change in the way that we're, we're looking at our fiscal landscape. John, could I just add one point again, getting to your question about the newness of all of this. Um, you know, I'll, there's something about people understanding the numbers to some extent. So with income tax, uh, where Scottish income tax is now varying from the rest of the UK in certain respects, um, what our people have done is look and try to uh, help us make judgments about the behavioral impact of those differences. And that means looking at population growth, at migration in and out, at a number of factors. Um, and in our recent report, we said would maybe, you know, be 13 million pounds, whatever the, the, the exact number was of, and, and that sounds like a really big number, but that's actually 0.1% of the uh, revenue from income tax in Scotland, which is 11.7 billion pounds. So sometimes people hear a number and think, think that's tremendous. It's up to us to communicate where it is really significant, where it's marginal, and where actually it makes very little difference. So again, learning for all of us and learning, I think, for the public as well. Yeah. When, in, your, in your opening remarks, both, both of you, Robert and Susan, made uh, made some reference to international uh, comparisons and the way in which our set of arrangements um, align or otherwise against what's done in other countries. And broadly speaking, I got the impression uh, that you were saying that in being able to design this afresh, there were some features of the Scottish arrangements that you would, uh, that you would consider to be um, uh, better in an objective sense than those elsewhere. Could you expand that a little? Well, I, th I think as Susan mentioned, I mean, the, the unusual feature of both of our institutions relative to most, the Dutch will be the closest, uh, is that we do that we are the monopoly producer of the forecast. And as Alison says, the government either has to or is required to say whether it is going to accept them as a basis for uh, doing the forecast. In most other countries, the fiscal watchdog either looks at the numbers that the government produces and may say we think these are okay or that the macroeconomic numbers that they're based on are, uh, are you know, reasonable or otherwise. There are other countries where the government produces a set of numbers, the fiscal institution produces a set of numbers and you can compare the two. So this arrangement is, is relatively unusual. Uh, I mean, I think well, you'll both know better the, the international comparators in, in, in the federal countries that have split this too. There are some relatively large national level institutions. Like, I mean, the Spanish Fiscal Council, for example, two thirds of its work is actually looking at the public finances of its regions rather than 
uh, than at the, the federal uh, level. Uh, and other institutions, you know, in other countries, you have more of that done by institutions at that appropriate level. So I think it's, it's very dangerous to assume that there is a, there's no one size fits all answer. But I, the, the most unusual thing about us is that, we, is that we are producing the forecasts and therefore ministers have to decide what to do with that as distinct from you know, a fiscal institution that looks at a ministerial forecast and says, do we believe this or not? And of course, deciding you know, how far you have to go before something is unreasonable is, you know, is, a, is a matter of judgment in its own right. John, you asked if, if this was a, a better way. Um, the way I describe us and I talk to people I know is that we're pioneering in this. Um, better? I don't know. Um, I would like to think it is. But actually what we're doing is pioneering something um, that uh, others may, um, may become interested in. And certainly with the OECD network, one comes across countries or in the case of Australia, for instance, um, states that are beginning to take on some of these responsibilities, and they're very interested in talking to us, um, in particular in Scotland, because we are a nation within a, a larger unit about what's happening. So there is um, both a pioneering, pioneering aspect and possibly an influencing aspect as well. And Alison, I'm, I'm always conscious of the limitations on what you can say. But clearly, in constructing this framework, the Scottish Government were making choices uh, about how to, uh, how to do that and, and choices to incorporate uh, some, of, uh, some of these uh, pioneering elements, to borrow uh, uh, Susan's, uh, Susan, Susan's word. Is, is, there, is there anything you can say about um, the thinking that informed those choices? So um, I think it's fair to say that even that has evolved. So from that initial phone call that Susan will have had from John Swinney, um, actually what was being asked of that to be established fiscal commission at that point was actually to, to um, give a reasonableness test on the forecast generated by the Scottish Government. So actually we started probably nearer to the other the other end of this, or near, there is a spectrum on these things at, at that end where, um, in effect, we were looking for some affirmation or some independent testing of the forecasts we generated ourselves. Um, one of the things that happened, though, between the Scotland Act 2012 and 2016, with so much more now being raised as income here in Scotland, then that was part of that further evolution to say, OK, Fiscal Commission actually goes on a statutory basis and also generates the forecast. So, um, so I, think fair, fair, I think it's fair to say initially, um, you know, very few governments like to cede power. Um, so I think in many ways it felt safer generating the forecasts and having someone to, to then verify them, having an independent organization to do that. But I think it's, you know, what has been the evolution is with more responsibility devolved, actually has moved it to, to being that generated space. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's turn to uh, general uh, questions and answers. And I'm, I'm just going to stand up so that uh, the people at the back of the room are not systematically uh, disadvantaged because I can't see their hands. Um, we'll, we'll do as we normally do and, uh, and take two or three questions at a, uh, at a time so that uh, uh, we can give more people a chance to, uh, uh, to join in the, uh, uh, the, the process. Um, there's, there's only one rule for this, uh, for this session, uh, which is to, uh, I think, remember uh, that uh, this year's Scottish budget is still a live parliamentary exercise and Alison cannot be expected uh, to answer questions uh, on what is going on inside that process or what its outcome uh, is likely to be. But other than that, uh, we have free reign. Over to you. Okay, can I take one here and one there? There's, there's a mic just coming. There are roving mics. Ian Russell, Office of Statistics Regulation. Um, one difference I think I noted between the OBR and Scottish Fiscal Commission 
uh, Robert, you mentioned the OBR has a guaranteed access to data, whereas the Scottish Fiscal Commission doesn't have that same right of access. Um, so my question is directed at um, Susan, basically. Do you feel you need to bolster the, um, the rights of the Scottish Fiscal Commission to access data to have the same level of access that the OBR enjoys as far as the UK? Uh, just before you answer, Susan, if we take the other question. I'm Gavin McCrone. Um, one of the important aspects in the way the economy works is that when you go into a recession, tax revenue goes down and public expenditure on benefits and things goes up, which is one of the reasons why governments tend to get uh, have to borrow more in recessions. Now, if they can't do that, it makes the recession a great deal worse. And what worried me about what Alison said was that we have to balance the budget in Scotland every year without that sort of flexibility. So I wondered what the answer to that was. Susan, you first. Okay, me, me first. Data is, is really important to what we do, and, and you'll know that given your own role um, in the statistics world, Ian. Um, we, uh, as an entity, actually sign up to the, uh, the code of practice around data. We think that's really important. Um, there is a, a, an accepted code of practice uh, nationally. Uh, maybe it's international, I don't know. Um, but uh, data matters. We can't do anything that we do without the data. Now, our legislation gives us more or less the right of access to data from certain bodies, but not universally. That's absolutely right. And what we do and have done is work with those agencies and bodies um, who have the data that, uh, who collect the data that we need. Um, and quite honestly, it's, it's what you do in any enterprise. You develop a relationship, you find the right people, you hope to help them understand what you need. Um, they also will find they may need to put a new team together, they may need to understand what we do. I mean, there is a learning process there. So it's not always easy, um, but we are getting there. Uh, and what we've also found, we published a report uh, in September which was a report of our uh, data needs because one of the parliamentary com committees asked uh, us if we could um, put that down on paper, as it were. Uh, and um, where we have useful data from some of even our Scottish uh, organizations as well as the UK organizations. Sometimes we could use them in a different time frame. We could use them laid out differently. So we keep asking. Um, I think the phrase is, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, and for the most part, we found uh, cooperation. Sometimes it takes longer to get there than other times. Okay. I'll let you answer the, um, <laughs> the easy one. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, so, yes, the tax revenue going down versus Social Security going up. I suppose the one thing at the moment is that with what's devolved in Social Security, although there's some large numbers associated with that that Susan's already outlined, where I would say we're not exposed to some of the biggest areas of risk in terms of Social Security because it's only a relatively um, narrower band of Social Security that's been devolved to Scotland. So that gives me a degree of comfort. But you're absolutely right. When we are dealing with this, we do not have the borrowing powers to close the gap. So there are tough decisions that have to be taken year on year um, looking ahead. And I think that's where I'm with me mentioning about the medium-term financial strategy. That publication in May 2018 actually was a really important thing to just put out there for the general public, for those who are interested, for the parliament to actually see that there are ranges of income estimates and expenditure estimates that will be part of our future and actually starting to prepare for the sorts of conversations and discussions that are needed. Um, that said, you know, there are things where there, there's an awful lot of work to make sure that the government stays front-footed on these things. There's a lot of work that's happening in terms of supporting employment. Um, you know, our, our economy is actually sort of holding its own at this moment in time. There's also something that was put out last um, September in the programme for government of the National Infrastructure Mission. We know that when there was the last big um, recession in the crash, one of the big things that government could do at that point was actually invest in infrastructure. Um, a third of the growth in our GDP during that crash time was um, attributed to infrastructure investment. So that national infrastructure mission 
which is actually to set a standard and a goal by the end of the next parliament as to the level of investment there is and see that trajectory grow, supported and aided by the work of the National Infrastructure Commission that's being established, um, which will actually then inform some of the decisions of the government. I think those are, it, we will have to use all the tools at our disposal, basically, to make sure that we can keep the economy as vibrant as we can and, and to deal with the things within the constraints that we have. Our fiscal framework will be in place for a little while longer. It is subject to review. Um, and actually, you know, some of our living experience of the framework as it's been since the Scotland Act 2016 uh, will be part of informing that. But um, you know, these are the sorts of uh, spaces that the government and parliament in deciding on the budget each year will be in. Thank you. Well, one there. I, there's a little, nice little circle of three here. So one, two, and three. It's Joe Elliott. Susan, can I ask you, um, do you find yourself answering uh, what-if questions? Uh, if, I'm a, uh, if I'm in government, I'm interested in, you know, what the effect on the tax take will be if I, if I vary the rate of income tax, and uh, or the same with uh, land and buildings transaction tax. Do, do you answer those questions? questions and and you know i can see that if if you do then that gets you into debates about uh, debates about policy which is perhaps where you where you really don't want to get to so the second one further along the row uh, my name is andrew bolger i was wondering if bringing welfare into the equation has sort of introduced a particularly troublesome cuckoo into the nest i mean it's obviously based more on entitlement and uh, macroeconomic um, context, but we've also seen operationally the welfare system in this country has been facing some issues. I wonder if that department is equally bad at forecasting, and if so, could the sort of contagion spill across the border? border? Right, Peter de Vick, uh, I have actually got two questions. First of all, do you ever find that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is interested in obtaining from you the kind of views that you might have that are relevant to his decision making. The other one is that the Scottish government keeps telling everyone that wants to hear it that it is all because of the ghastly Tories in Westminster that they are in such a bad situation. Well, the Barnett formula put them in a very, very advanced state compared with the rest of the United Kingdom. Could all three of you comment on those two points. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I'll take the easier ones and probably be quiet when we get to the hard one. Joe, um, that's a, a very good question, something that exercised our minds at the beginning, um, and we made it very clear that even when we were on a non-statutory basis, we would not um, be doing forecasts based on scenarios and what ifs, either from the government or from parties not in government, um, because that is the other side of it. Do we do this for everybody? Um, that's not the kind of body we are. So um, the, the various parties, including the government, need to have expertise on their own staff, or they need to outsource somewhere to um, explore some of those what if scenarios. <laughs> Scenarios. We don't do that, uh, and we think it's really important that we keep the line very clean, that if there is a stated government policy, we cost that. We provide a costing for that, and we then weave that into our forecasts. But we don't do um, what-ifs. And you're absolutely right, because then we would be in a position, whether consciously or not, influencing policy, whatever, that isn't our role, and we would no longer be independent. And, and the independence is the most important characteristic of a body like ours. So the answer is no, quite consciously, we don't, uh, we don't do that. Um, just a quick comment on the introduction of, of welfare. Um, first of all, not all Social Security uh, expenditure is being devolved. Um, it's mainly um, programs which are eligibility related. It still will ultimately lead to about three billion pounds of uh, expenditure in Scotland. But the way it is set up, at least at this point, is that the UK government will transfer the money um, for the program that it offers at the rest of the UK. The Scottish government has the ability then to change the program if it wants. It can widen eligibility, it can expand the program, it can change timing, uh, it, it, can, it can do whatever elements it wants to add, but then it has to be able to afford those and to, to be able to, to pay for those. So um, it is not 
about the entire welfare system, and it's not all in the hands of government here. There are pieces that are. Um, the finance minister asking for our views. Um, and the answer is the finance ministers that um, I, we have served under, have been um, uh, incredibly proper. Um, and they have not done that. They haven't come to say, um, you know, we're thinking about this, and, and, you know, what do you think? What answer might you come out with? You know, where are you? That isn't the way it works, and uh, it should not work. We actually have a formal protocol up on our website, and we revisit this maybe once a year, depending on how well it's working, and it speaks to um, how we interact. We interact with a lot of very helpful colleagues in Scottish government who are doing work for the government, um, and we you know, talk about issues we're thinking about and data sources and all sorts of things that forecasters like to talk about. Um, and, uh, but we then um, make up our own uh, minds and uh, develop our forecasts. There is a timetable before the date of a budget, which is always pre-announced, when that report, our forecast report, cannot be changed, you know, it's, it, that's it. It will not change, not a word or a comma. And it's then sent to the finance minister so that uh, his or, or, you know, at some point perhaps her staff would um, look at it and, uh, you know, they can then ask questions of it, but our forecast won't change and they will become public on budget day. So um, it, we're, we're very clean about that and it really helps to have these ways of interacting, memorialized in writing, and again, made public. We, we make everything public on our website. Our, the basis for our models and, and you know what we're putting in them, we think that transparency of that sort is really important, and, um, and, and, and that's just, that's the way we, that's the way we operate. Um, into it, so I'll, I'll stop now. Peter wants my answer, but uh, um, who wants to? answer the big question. <laughs> Why don't I Robert, yeah. yeah. I think any question with the Barnet formula in it, I will pass on, <laughs> on to the appropriate authorities. Uh, let me just pick up on the, um, uh, on the what if issue. Uh, again, we, we don't provide, you know, there has been a debate about, for example, whether we should look at uh, other political parties' proposals during the course of elections, which again, referring back to our Dutch colleagues who do this in the most extensive fashion and you know they have I think around 10 parties to have to do this for so it's a huge document they come up with of looking at the at the potential impact of all the election platforms but just in terms of the in in the in the weeks running up to a a budget or a fiscal event in Westminster uh, we're obviously giving the Treasury a, a series of iterations of our economic and fiscal forecasts so they can see the amount of room for maneuver they might have against whatever targets, formal or informal, that they may have, and, we, and, and that progresses over a sort of, as I say, six, eight-week period. Over the same period, the, the government will give us, a few weeks ahead of the budget, a list of policy measures that it is thinking of announcing. And we can be confident when we get that list that by the time you get to the budget or the fiscal event, half of them will have dropped off that list and half of the ones that are on at the end won't have been on at the beginning. And sometimes the government will have put two or three on the list at the beginning knowing it's only going to do one of them. So there is a process of, of looking at uh, the potential costing, thinking about that, discussing it. But at the end of the day, the, the government over time narrows down the list of things that it's thinking about. So, you know, and part of our, uh, the nature of our relationship though, is we are very transparent, but we don't, you know, amusing as it would be, we don't have an annex in our report saying, you thought this was bad, just, you know, let me tell you about five of the things that they were thinking of doing, but bottled out of at the last minute. So, you know, we, we don't reveal that, but there is a process, you know, it's not as though the government firmly decides on a set of policy measures, then hands them over to us and can't retreat from them. There's a, there's a, a process of iteration uh, in, in looking at those. On, on welfare, uh, I mean, welfare forecasting is, you know, has all, you know, the challenges of other areas of forecasting. Um, we have a report coming out next week on the, uh, the changes in uh, disability benefit spending over recent years, including various sets of reforms, most recently moved from disability living allowance to uh, personal independence payment. And, you know, 
one lesson you pick up time and again from these sort of things, not unique to welfare, but a particular issue here, is that major reform programs actually being able to understand how that is going to affect when you're moving to new systems, to new sets of rules. And it's not simply a question of have you got the right economic inputs to just drop the number on employment growth or earnings growth, but what is a new set of, what is a new regime for the sort of medical tests that you require people to do? And what's the mechanism for if people disagree with the decision that's been taken, how they can appeal that? It can be a very complicated process in, in, in getting that out. And generally speaking, reforms of this sort always take longer to implement than the government hopes or expects to begin with, and they often don't save as much money, or in the case of the DLA to PIP one, you can actually end up initially hoping to, spend, to save money uh, and ending up uh, uh, spending more. The, what the biggest welfare reform we have at the UK level at the moment is the move to universal credit which is you know, a hugely complicated process of, 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 of amalgamating and moving to a new system for working age benefits. And the, the forecasting challenge there is I liken to walking across a, a tightrope. You start with one system that you know how it works, you have a good run of data, you understand the relationships, you're on firm ground. When you get to the other end and the new system is fully oper you know, operationalized, it's had time to bed itself in, you're on firm ground there but you're on a very wobbly path between the two because with the mixture of the two systems together, knowing what's going on now, how much of the new news is actually telling you about the long-term functioning of the system that you're going to end up with is very difficult. So, uh, you know, there's lots of fun and games to be had ahead, depending obviously on the scale of the welfare reform, but the, the, the substantive reform of the system as distinct from just, we're gonna make it 10% more or less generous this year, does present significant forecasting challenges, always. And now we all look at Alice. <laughs> um, so just in terms of the other questions before I come to the one at the end about the Barnett formula, um, just in terms of the what if questions, um, Mr. Elliott's uh, question, I think one of the things that's quite interesting in that, which again, I would put more in the sort of towards the pioneering end of the spectrum, is that in the autumn 2017, the Scottish government actually put out a tax consultation paper I think this was actually quite unusual, um, but actually was a way of saying, yes, the landscape is different here in Scotland. It's recognizing that there is this different relationship that's happening with the citizen and the government, and therefore the decision ultimately that Parliament takes on the budget. And so that consultation, saying what some of the options that were available within the, the, the bandwidth of powers that are devolved around income tax, was actually quite a major change. And so in many ways, that policy what-if space wasn't just something that was um, in a parliamentary space. It was actually out there. And I don't know if there's any, any members in this room that actually chose to comment on it, but I've had a number of people speak to me to say it was good having the opportunity to see that and to be able to make a comment. And those, all those comments were actually um, received really helpfully by the government. Um, as Susan has already said, then when policy decisions have been taken by the government, then as you'd expect around tax, that happens in a very protected space so that there's no chance of people actually misusing that information ahead of the change and ahead of announcements. Um, and that when we have the appropriate protocols to share those, those policy decisions with the Fiscal Commission so that then the, the forecasts can be generated and then published in the way that Susan has outlined. Um, I have nothing further really to say on the welfare point um, other than the fact that I think because of the, the dynamic that there is, and this is another change where we will create our own knowledge and experience on, but the fact it's three billion and it's a different type of spend of an order of magnitude of, of a demand eligibility led, and I think actually having that, that input from the Fiscal Commission is, is extremely helpful. Um, on the last question on, um, on the Barnett formula, so the element of the, the budget that's the block grant that is generated by the Barnett formula um, obviously is one of the elements now that is the most um, stable in the calculation of the budget envelope that's available to us each year. Um, and actually all the other things around tax are the ones that with time, because of this corrective mechanism, will have some element of variability. But I think the key thing is, is that element of the Barnett formula is shrinking. And as Susan has said, by the time even when we see the full devolution in practice of the Scotland Act 2016 requirements, 
then that mix between what comes from a Barnet calculation and what comes from locally in Scotland generated income will be 50-50 will be or, or actually more than 50% is likely to be coming from our tax mix as opposed to the Barnet mix. And I think that's it. You know, this is the journey not only of fiscal devolution, but fiscal responsibility. Um, and so I think that's probably the fairest way I can ask, answer your question about Barnet. Okay, we've probably got time just for a couple more. So, uh, yes, okay, the, the prize goes to the three fast hands. Uh, yeah. uh, one, two, and three. Thank you, Graeme McCormick. Uh, there's a debate in Scotland just now um, regarding the aspiration to have a really worthwhile universal citizen's income uh, and also the question of land as a source of public funding. Uh, and under existing powers, it would be possible for the Scottish Government to decide to uh, raise all funding, both uh, devolved taxes and the amount that covers uh, UK taxes, by an annual ground rent or land value tax or something like that, and um, basically rebate uh, the UK tax uh, that Scottish taxpayers pay uh, back to them through the, the Barnet consequentials. Um, if that was to happen, and of course there then would be certainty of how much the Scottish Government would be able to uh, obtain every year through land value taxation, because it's something you can't avoid. Um, with all due respect, what would be the purpose then of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office of Budget Responsibility in a Scottish context? <laughs> I think if you, <laughs> we don't comment on policy, Alice. <laughs> Jeremy Peat. Um, I, I don't envy either OBR or the Fiscal Commission making forecasts in these very uncertain times, but one question is that... Um, if we were to head for uh, a no-deal Brexit, then it's very clear that the economic and fiscal outlook would be very different from that which is assumed as the base central scenario in both of the forecasts that were prepared for the UK and Scottish budget discussions. Uh, the Prime Minister has decided that it's appropriate to start preparations for a no-deal Brexit. Have either of you started preparations for revised forecasts in the event of a no deal uh, Brexit on the assumption that if the fiscal changes would be substantial in the forecast you would then derive that there would be a need for major changes in fiscal policy? And the last question was just here. Yeah. Good evening. Nigel Smith is my name. Um, it's really an extension of Gavin's question. Um, where, where there is an adverse outturn, which obviously has to be corrected quite quickly, are these potentially on a scale that could introduce um, volatility into departmental spending, given that the whole push of departmental budgets is to try and get beyond a year to a three-year focus or whatever. This sounds as if it has the potential to go the other way and introduce more difficulties for departments. Okay, thank you. We've, we've got six or seven minutes to gallop <laughs> through those topics. Uh, well, do you want me to grasp the Brexit uh, nettle? I think. Uh, I was going to grasp that, but you can do it, Robert. <laughs> uh, congratulations! This is the longest I've managed to get through uh, a discussion of this sort before somebody who's brought the topic up in quite some time. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, on the basis of the, the way that we've approached the task of, of producing the fiscal and economic forecast so far, we have said since the referendum, we made some initial adjustments in our first forecast in November 2016 after the vote uh, and said, look, we have no idea where exactly this process is going to end up, so we will make some broad brush adjustments which will be consistent with a number of possible outcomes that would be consistent with, over a period of time, weaker business investment, less net inward migration, 
uh, smaller trade flows, uh, lower um, productivity growth for a while, etc. And we haven't we haven't moved those uh, subsequently. We did produce a working paper last year explaining the sorts of issues that we would need to and want to take into account as and when we know what the long term trade migration relationships are going to be. The more immediate issue of, uh, and I would distinguish here between a no deal outcome, which something that was a smooth transition to WTO roles or, or uh, less, uh, less integration with the EU, and what you might think of as a disorderly or disruptive uh, exit. Uh, we haven't published any assessments uh, of those, but interestingly, the Bank of England did, uh, at the end of last year, uh, in addition to producing some you know, different uh, potential outcomes of you know, a deal that had more or less integration with the EU in the long term, they looked at uh, the prospect of what, what might happen on the, to the economy uh, in the event of a, of, a, of a bumpy exit. They were very clear that those were scenarios for the purpose in particular of stress testing the health of the banking sector and whether it could cope with those sorts of things, but it's also something that understandably would be food for thought for us and for other people coming up with that. I think a couple of points are worth making. One is that you know, this would be a very unusual sort of economic shock to hit, and the challenge for forecasters is therefore that you don't have previous historical examples that you can easily look back to. You'd be thinking about uh, a shock to the economy that was simultaneously you know, weakening people's demand, people's desire to spend, businesses to invest, et cetera, consumers, et cetera. But on the other side, a what economists would call a supply shock that gets in the way of the economy's ability to produce and distribute goods and services. And one of the difficulties is knowing you know, how severe an impact that would have but then crucially, coming back to Alison's point about your medium-term fiscal position, how, were, how persistent would the economic and fiscal consequences of that be? Would it be a sort of really grim, you know, gumming up of the economy, but from where you had a reasonable bounce back to something that may not be quite as good as you would have had in the absence of that bumpy exit in the first place? Or would it be something that the the impact is, is fairly persistent. And you'd need to make judgments about both of those things. And one thing that we certainly did in the paper last year is to highlight that you, you know, there is very little to go on in terms of past experience of those sorts of things. But you know, we will have to make a judgment you know, according to our own forecast timetables of whether you know, we are constrained to produce our forecasts on the basis of current government policy um, you know, there's interesting interpretation of what that means in the current context uh, as to uh, whether, you know, you have to assume a disruptive exit as being your, uh, as being your lead assumption. But that's, that's not something we, we, we can prejudge yet. But obviously, as I say, I refer you to the paper. We've been giving thought to the sorts of longer-term judgments on Brexit impact you might need to make. So I will add simply a footnote um, to what Robert has said very clearly and eloquently in Scotland. Um, obviously, we have dis discussed and we've been mindful of Brexit and, and what might happen separately from the OBR, uh, made our own judgments, uh, where we've come out and taken a very similar perspective in our forecast to date, which is uh, what we call an orderly exit, which has a number of you know, ranges. It's not just one version of this that can range from here to here. Um, and uh, as I think I said before, that uh, a, um, a disorderly exit um, is something that's a risk to the forecast, but not incorporated in our forecast today, because with all the information we've had to date and up to the time that our current forecasts were produced and agreed, um, that has been our perspective. Um, it's actually, we think, quite helpful that we have a very similar perspective to the OBR um, for, for various reasons, because as you've heard, some of the work and the forecast that the OBR does, um, that they have a very big impact in Scotland in terms of uh, block grant adjustments and, and various other factors. So it's, it's not bad that we're in a similar space. Um, a comment about a no deal, um, possible no deal Brexit is that again, that will have detail behind it if that is what happens. There isn't just one version of no deal. You know, we all tend to think in, you know, it's this or it's that. Um, and so if 
we would have to, for any future forecasts, build in whatever we know about whatever that settlement will be. But it will take a little time till that detail comes out, even in a disorderly exit. Um, we can imagine and we can speculate it'll be messy and horrible, whatever it is. But um, the point is we will forecast based on, on evidence and, and try to take judgments on what the details of that exit will be. And that we can't do overnight because there is no just one version. Um, so I just share that with you. Just, just for completeness, um, the budget that's actually with Parliament at the moment, um, which was set out pre-Christmas, will be going through its process. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance actually um, was clear to explain that that was um, generated on the basis of the same assumptions that were being used in the Westminster budget when that was set out, that there would be a deal and there would be a smooth transition. Um, obviously, that, that process is continuing. Stage three of the budget in Parliament will be on the 21st of February. Um, if, with time, that's seen as something that needs to be adjusted, then that would be something that would happen in, in due course and may well be into the financial year when there's a, a clearer picture of what's required. Do you want to pick just a couple of the... Um, land, you know... Uh, Formally, we're not allowed to talk about the, the, the merits of particular tax reforms. If my, the pr current occupant of my previous job at the IFS here, he would applaud your you know, enthusiasm for a land value tax in principle. I guess one issue is whether you would be in a world, even if you implemented that, you would be in a world in which you relied on it entirely. Uh, your you know, most sensible systems of tax design, you're looking at a range of, you, know, you don't put all your eggs into the one into the one basket, even if you know, many tax reformers would argue that that is an egg that is long overdue to join the basket. OK, well, sadly, we've, uh, sadly we're out of time uh, for this, but, uh, but Susan, Robert, and Alison are, will all be here during uh, drinks for people who want to uh, continue the, uh, the conversation. I think, we can, uh, I think we can say with some confidence that there are not three more knowledgeable people in the world uh, about this set of arrangements uh, in Scotland that we could have had the benefit of uh, listening to. Uh, and so we've been enormously privileged, I think, to, uh, to have the benefit of such a full exploration of the, uh, of the subject matter. We've also acquired what I think may well become my... Uh, uh, my acronym of the year, IFIS, uh, for organizations of this. And we've discovered the existence of a Parisian bistro, which in time may come to be more famous than Granita uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the annals of Scottish political history. So please join me in uh, thanking our three speakers. <laughs>